Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a good week. I just want to make a quick announcement before we get started this morning. Uh, just a quick reminder announcement. As of now, we'll be opening up the church for uh, worship service on August 2nd. Uh, we're currently working on the preparation plan, um, building our sanitation team, making sure we have all of our ducks in a row. And so August 2nd is when we are planning on doing that, and more details will come to you in the next couple weeks of what to expect for reopening. So just wanted to let you guys know that before we started. So we got a lot to do this morning, a lot to, uh, uh, to go over, so let's jump right in. And here's a question for you. What does it look like to live a gospel-centered life? I think that's a question that most of us ask ourselves quite often as we're contemplating the reality of what it means to live the Christian life, right? What does a gospel-centered life look like? We hear those terms all the time. What does it look like? That's the question we're going to ask and answer the next two weeks as we walk through this passage. And so if you haven't already done so, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. In the next two weeks, we'll be looking at verses 27 through 30 and answering the question, what does a gospel-centered life truly look like? All right, it's time to press pause in the video and read the passage together with whoever you're watching it with. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Ready, go. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for... The holiday weekend hopefully that everyone got to relax and spend time with family we do pray for our country during this time lord just some really bizarre odd times lord but you are in control of it all you are in in in, in sovereign control of it all lord you nothing is surprising you right now lord and as we're about to enter into this passage i pray that as you are ripening the mission field with all the craziness in our world today, Lord, we know that you have called us to live the gospel-centered life, Lord. And living the gospel-centered life means that we are to be constantly growing in you and taking the gospel to the world. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be challenged in that this morning as we walk through this passage and as we walk through this passage next week also. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. The opening theme of the opening chapter, or the major theme of the opening chapter of Philippians is the gospel. Over and over again, in the first chapter, Paul makes direct, explicit mentionings of the gospel. First, in, in verse 5, Paul co commends the Philippians for their participation with him in the gospel. And that's always the basis of true fellowship, sharing together in the gospel. If someone else... If someone else doesn't have the gospel in their lives, we have no true fellowship with them. Now, we can have friendships that show uh, believers a general love, but there's only true fellowship in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then next, in verse 7, Paul makes mention of the gospel again. Paul affirms uh, the Philippians for, for sharing with him in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. As Paul's in Rome, he's, he's giving defense of the gospel. And as they are in Philippi, they're giving defense of the gospel. And listen, no matter where the believer is on earth, there will always be opposition to the gospel. Uh, uh, the, the, the cross is offensive. It's unavoidable to the, to the unbelieving world to be in opposition with, with believers. And so all believers in Jesus Christ must always be willing and ready and able to give a defense. Next, mention of the gospel happens in verse 12. This is all important for where we're going the next two weeks, so we're setting the table here. In verse 12, Paul acknowledges that he, that he sees his present imprisonment in Rome as something positive. He says his imprisonment is for the greater progress of the gospel. No matter what Paul's circumstances were, he saw it as an opportunity for the gospel to move forward. He understands being in prison is a divine appointment, at the, uh, appointment at the, and that there's a reason and a purpose for him being there which of course is the opportunity to share the gospel with the guards and, and the people around him and encourage people to, to live for the gospel even in suffering. No matter where you find yourself in this world as a Christian, God has placed you where you are so that the gospel can go forward. You may be the only believer in your office. You may be wondering, why doesn't God uh, allow me to work in such a place where, where there's nothing but unbelievers? 
Well, that's a good question. And according to Paul, the question, that, that, the, the answer is that you are there for the greater purpose of the gospel. No matter where you are, you're there for the greater purpose of the gospel. I mean, why would there be unsaved family members among all your loved ones? Why wouldn't God just give, uh, 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 make your whole family Christians? Well, the answer is that God has sovereignly and strategically placed you where you are for the greater progress of the gospel. Acts 17 talks about that. No matter what circumstances you're in, no matter where you find yourself, the invisible hand of God is orchestrating every detail for the greater purpose of the gospel, the greater progress of the gospel. Man, if we truly, only if we truly believe that today, right? The gospel would explode in our community if each one of us truly believed this. If we came together in our church, lived like this, the gospel would explode. God has placed us exactly where we are so that the gospel would never be far away from the unbelievers that are all around us. But we need to actually share the gospel with people that are around us for it to have any power, right? Are you sharing the gospel with the unsaved people around you right now? Moving on. The next mention of the gospel is in verse 16. Here Paul identifies himself as one appointed for the defense of the gospel. Paul's identity, his belief, and his standing are in the gospel. He knows that he's been divinely and sovereignly appointed for this. Do you understand that for your life? And so it's clear to see that the theme of the first chapter of Philippians is the gospel, right? And that brings us to our passage for the next two weeks. In verse 27, we see yet another mention of the gospel as Paul urges the Philippians to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Not only are they to believe in the gospel, but they're to live out the gospel. To believe the gospel is only the first step of the entrance into the kingdom of God. The entire rest of our Christian experience is living in the power of the gospel and conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Paul saw his entire existence as being consumed with the gospel, and it should be the same for us also. Now, building on that, what's interesting about these, these first chapter references to the gospel is that none of them are talking about the actual entry into the Christian life. Paul's not talking about conversion in chapter 1. No, no th this letter to the Philippians is dealing with believers who are already on the path of true sanctification. And they're living out their Christian lives preoccupied with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does this mean? Well, to be preoccupied with the gospel of Jesus Christ... Is up on your screen. To be preoccupied with the gospel is very simply to be preoccupied with Jesus himself because Jesus is the gospel. And we talked about this a few weeks ago in verse 21 of chapter 1. Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. He could have just as easily said for me to live is the gospel because the gospel is Christ. It's Jesus and him crucified. That is the gospel. The gospel is very precious to Paul. And so today, as we look at this section, beginning in, in, verse chapter, or in verse 27, what we'll see is Paul urging believers to live a gospel-centered life. Paul wants believers to be preoccupied with the gospel. He wants believers to have their lives aligned with the gospel. That's what this passage is all about. And so as we dive into this passage, here's the proposition for this morning, and actually it's more of an outline we're going to use this outline to define what a gospel-centered life looks like. And again, it's going to take two weeks to complete that. And so first up in our outline is that there is a certain conduct required for a gospel-centered life. Verse 27 begins with the conduct. Paul starts this section by issuing the command to the Philippians. And by the way, this is the, command, this is the first command of the entire letter. So this is important. The beginning of verse 27, Paul says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. The word only here means one and only. This and this only. Paul's focus for, for life is the gospel and living in a manner worthy of the gospel. He says only this. There's nothing else. The gospel and the gospel alone. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of that gospel, the gospel of Christ. To paraphrase this, Paul is saying, live in a way that honors and glorifies the gospel of Jesus Christ. Live in a way that's consistent with the demands of the gospel. We'll talk about that more soon. The gospel calls for faith in Christ and denial of self. 
The gospel calls for death to self and obedience to God. The gospel calls for our submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ. The gospel calls for us to leave the world behind and to follow Christ. This is how we entered the kingdom when we were saved. And this is how we're to continue living in the kingdom after we're saved. Only conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now, let's talk about the verb, conduct yourselves. Obviously, our conduct is very important to God. How we live our life is of extreme importance to, to God as, as believers. No, believer, no believers are to ever have a laissez-faire attitude and be passive in their Christian life. There's no passivity for Christians. Instead, with great intentionality and aggressive faith, we're to conduct ourselves in a certain manner. And conduct yourselves in the Greek is only one word, and it comes from a root word that we get our English word politics and, and political and politician from. The, word, the, the root word of that is polis, which means city. And the idea is to be a citizen in a city or in a city-state. And as you know, you, you would have obligations to the government as a law-abiding a citizen. As you would live in this city, you would be under the laws and the rules and the regulations of the city. You can't just live any way you want when you're a citizen. There are statutes and parameters that direct the way in which you live. That's the word that's being used here. It denotes civil responsibilities in an earthly citizenship. It refers to political duties where you are obligated to pay certain taxes and render certain services. You're obligated to comply with the laws of that city or that empire in this case. It's a very technical word. It's not the normal word for obey or keep or heed. It's, it's a specific word that has an exceptional meaning for the Philippians. It's very intentional here. You see, the, the city of Philippi was unlike most cities of the day. It was a Roman colony. Even though it wasn't anywhere near Rome, it was a Roman colony. And the reason it was a Roman colony is that years earlier, there was a civil war fought there. It was between Octavian and, and Anthony, and Octavian defeated Anthony. And after that victory, the Roman soldiers stayed and occupied Philippi rather than returning back to Rome. In fact, Philippi became like a retirement place for, for Roman soldiers. And as a result of the Roman occupation, or, o occupation of, of Philippi, which is Again, on the far parameters of the empire, Philippi was given a special status. It was known as a Roman colony. And so anyone who lived within Philippi had special protection under Roman law. They had certain provisions they were afforded to because they were a part of this city-state. But they also had special responsibilities as well. They had a greater allegiance and loyalty that was owed to Caesar, even though he wasn't anywhere nearby. And it's because of the binding protection relationship that that they had as a roman colony and so paul has all of this in mind when he says in verse 27 only conduct yourselves it misses in the english uh, but in the original language this is a play on words that paul's making here he actually made this word up and so what he's saying is this you believers in philippi you enjoy a very privileged status in the roman empire and there's an illusion here that you need to be a good citizen of the Roman Empire. But more than that, Paul's saying you are a member of a higher empire, a much higher kingdom, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And there are laws and regulations uh, that the king of kings has put in place for you. And as you live as a believer, you are under the moral obligation to be a good citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Paul mentions this dual citizenship again in, in, in Philippians 3.20. They had a citizenship in the Roman Empire that afforded them special privileges, special prerogatives by, by living in this Roman colony. But in their dual citizenship, they had an even higher citizenship in the kingdom of God. And so in Philippians 3.20, Paul writes, for our citizenship is in heaven. Now, it's very intentional for Paul Paul to say this to the believers in Philippi. It's an enor it has enormous meaning. I, I don't want to skip this until you understand. It has enormous meaning. We're spending a lot of time on this verb. Enormous meaning because they were unique citizens of a Roman Empire. But more than that, their citizenship in the courts of heaven above, because of that, they owe loyalty and allegiance to Jesus Christ above 
everything else and in a very special way. And so all of that to point out this morning that this applies to us too, especially in this moment right now. Although there's a lot of turmoil in our country, most powerful nation, the most wonderful nation in the world, we live in the United States of America. And as an American, as American citizens, we have certain duties and certain responsibilities. Among those responsibilities are to observe the laws of the land, which we've tried to do during this pandemic. We are to pay our taxes. We're to serve our government when they call upon us to serve in different ways. And yet, we have a citizenship that's far greater and far higher, although a lot of us don't act like this sometimes. The kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a higher kingdom than the United States. And although I think we get this backwards many times, which is a real problem right now especially, with our primary citizenship being in heaven, our allegiance to Christ is greater than our allegiance to our country. Yes, we're to obey the laws of our land, but only to the extent where, we're, where they're not forcing us to compromise our convictions to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a delicate line in these times, of course. Now, I hope you're getting the picture of what Paul's saying here to the believers in Philippi. He says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now, I said we're going to spend a lot of time on this, in this verb, and I don't know about you, but I hate grammar. But grammar is extremely important for understanding Scripture, and it's extremely important here as we look at this, this word, conduct yourselves. So I want to tell you four things about this verb before we can move on. First, this verb, conduct yourselves, is in the present tense. And this means that Paul's saying that every moment of every day you are to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. This is to be your daily lifestyle. It's your ongoing manner of living. It's not take this day off, take that day off. It's an ongoing manner of living. Literally every minute of every day. So number one, it's in the present tense. It's a permanent obligation as long as you are on this earth, it's obligatory that you conduct yourselves in a certain manner, the manner of the gospel. Second, the verb is in the middle voice. This simply means that the responsibility lies with each and every one of us. It's not active, it's not passive, it's in the middle. Which means we, we must take the reins and assume this responsibility for ourselves. This is a decision that each one of us must make daily. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. We must do this ourselves. No one can make this choice for us. If you have children, you know that. You want them to make that choice, but they don't. And you've got to shepherd them to do so. But out of the desire of their hearts because they understand the gospel. It's a daily decision. Third, this verb is in the second person plural. And the impact of that, or the meaning of that, is that this applies to every believer. This isn't just for some believers in Philippi. This is for every believer in Philippi, and by extension, it applies to every believer in every church, in every generation, on every continent, in every place, and in every time. And then fourth, this verb is the, in the imperative mood, which means it's a command. And as I said, this is the first command of the book of Philippians. It's not an indicative statement which just makes some moral declaration. It's an imperative command. It's not a mere wish or desire that Paul has for the Philippians. This is actually a commandment from God that requires the immediate obedience of every believer who claims and has citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. So are you a, are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? Have you entered by salvation and faith into the kingdom of new birth? If so, this is passage this verse is directed to every one of us only all believers only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel now when he says a manner worthy of the gospel let's talk about that for a moment this is what we would call an overarching umbrella term that's a summary of every Christian duty and every Christian responsibility that there is in the entire Bible. We could take all the commands in the Bible that are relevant to us. We could take all the imperatives that speak directly to our lives. We could take the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. We could take the positive examples all throughout Scripture of great men and women of faith who, who are a pattern of the way that we should conduct ourselves. 
And all of that, as, as well as the implementation of the, of the wisdom principles from the book of Proverbs, all of this can be tucked into this very small little phrase, a manner worthy of the gospel. And so let's flesh that out a little bit. To live in a manner worthy of the gospel means that you and I live in submission to the Lord, of Jesus, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. For us to realize that our life is not our own. And that we have been bought with a price so that we can live for the glory of God. And that every agenda in our lives is to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's not your agenda, you're not living a life worthy of the manner or worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To love, to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ means that I am to be a, a, a repenter as I live my Christian life continually confessing my sins to God as I'm grieved and sorrowful for my sin and the ways that I hurt people. Living in a manner worthy of the gospel means that I should be acknowledging all of this to the Lord as he convicts me and brings sin to my attention, which we all sin every day. We need to be confessing that. And we should be living our life with self-denial as we're confessing that, realizing that most of our sin is just us wanting what we want for ourselves. We need to live with sin or self-denial, having died to self and, and our own true interests and giving everything up to God and lining up with his interests. Living in a manner worthy of the gospel means I should be a cross-bearer and that I should be following Jesus Christ with the world behind me and heaven before me. And as I follow Christ, I'm doing so with a lowliness of mind, with a humility of heart, with a radical, sold-out commitment to the one who hung on the cross for me and suffered and bled and died to take away my sins, your sins. All of these things and nothing less is what it means for you and I to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all so Paul begins this small section in Philippians with the conduct required to live a gospel-centered life. We are to conduct ourselves and live as citizens of a higher kingdom in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Do you understand what the Lord requires of you? Do you, do you see how God and his word has laid it all at your feet? Every step we take in this world, every word we utter, every decision we make, every action and reaction we, we, we undertake while we're on earth, we are to conduct, conduct ourselves in a manner that is consistent with and brings honor and glory to the very gospel of Jesus Christ that saved us. There's no yeah butting scripture. This is the conduct we're required, that's required as we seek to live a gospel-centered life. Now, second, the next piece of what a gospel-centered life looks like is that there's consistency required. The true gospel-centered life requires consistency, brothers and sisters. It's not here and there. We all need to be challenged with that. Especially in a time like this where we haven't had lots of opportunities to gather together. Are you being consistent in your walk with the Lord? The next thing that Paul asserts here is that Christians must conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, whether he is present or whether he is absent. Verse 27 again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here it is. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent. Paul says this to challenge the Philippians and, and us to live a worthy gospel-centered life whether he's there or not. Paul's not their source of grace or the source of their spiritual strength. Whether Paul comes or whether Paul remains absent, the Philippians are, are being fully enabled by God himself and the indwelling spirit of Christ to conduct themselves in a manner that brings glory to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, this is so important to Paul that in the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 12, he repeats this again. He says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Paul makes it abundantly clear that this absence, that his absence at the moment that he's in, in, in prison in Rome, and they're in Philippi in the church, he makes it abundantly clear that his absence doesn't allow them to become lax in their Christian living or to use him being in jail at any level as an excuse as to why their Christian life would be less than what it should be for the Lord. Because in reality, all that matters for, for us to be able to live a worthy life 
for the gospel is that God is in every believer and that God sees all and that God enables all believers to do everything that he requires of them. It's the same for us. Whether you're at home by yourself or in your office by yourself or in your car by yourself, whether you're in the library by yourself or in a classroom in the corner by yourself, cut off from all spiritual leaders uh, at that time and removed from Christian fellowship like we are so much today, none of this will ever be an acceptable excuse that we can use to be weak in our conduction of the gospel, living out the gospel. God will be everything that we need him to be as we find ourselves alone and absent from the proper spiritual leadership that we normally have and need. Now, this in no way removes us from the responsibility to, become a, uh, to be a part of the church and be with other believers even in these times because there's an enormous strength to be found when the word of God is being ministered by God-gifted, God-called men and women. You need to be a part of that. But when you're away from such God gifted, God called women and men, your Christian life should still work at full capacity because the Lord is always with you. If your Christian life has not been at full capacity during this time, then you've got, you've got issues with your understanding of what the gospel is and how it applies to every minute of every day of your life. The Lord is inside of you, always there for you, so that you can live a consistent life that exemplifies the worthiness of the gospel. So we've seen the conduct required. We've seen the consistency required. And now lastly, what I want us to look at in this passage, and, and we won't finish this point up this morning. This is a long point. We're going to look at, at some of this this week and the rest next week. Lastly, as we consider what the true gospel center look like, looks like, we come to the characteristics required. Characteristics required for, the, for, for living the gospel-centered life. There's a list that starts here at the end of verse 27 that extends into verse 30, right? And in the rest of this passage, we see some very specific things that help us to better define what a true gospel-centered life looks like. What is the conduct that's required in, the, in, in living a gospel-worthy life? Well, there are three characteristics that Paul draws our attention to here. Number one, we must stand together in the gospel. We must stand together in the gospel. Verse 27, only conduct yourselves in a, word, in a way worthy of the gospel so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear news of you that, now this is where we see what he desires for them. This is what will bring joy to his heart. This is what will bring pleasure to God. This is what will cause our witness and our testimony to be strong to the world. This is what will bring great joy to our own Christian lives. He says that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, struggling together for the faith of the gospel. This is what Paul wants to hear. Whether he's there or whether he's absent, he wants to know that they are standing firm in one spirit and in one mind. Now this verb, standing firm, means to be stationary. It means to not be pushed around, not be moved around. The idea here is that you are anchored in a place and that there's no reverse gear in you. You've taken your stand, you're immovable because of your convictions in the gospel. You're standing firm. It's a, it's a military term that pictures the duty of a soldier in a battle to hold his position. He's been assigned a position on the front lines. And wherever there's a breakdown, the enemy could slip through. And the enemy's always looking for the weakest soldier in the army. So they can slip through. If they can defeat the weakest soldier, it becomes the entry point to break rank and to penetrate and infiltrate and bring about a devastating threat and defeat. Paul's saying, don't let that happen in your fellowship and in your church. You need to stand firm. Don't back down. Don't turn and run. Be immovable in the midst of all spiritual warfare, which a lot of it happens in our own heart. Brothers and sisters, Satan is trying with all the arsenal of hell at his disposal to break into our church. It's a gospel-preaching, gospel-believing church that stands on the authority and the inerrancy of the Word of God and holds high the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and preaches without reservation that there is salvation in no other name than Jesus. 
And because of this, because this is what we believe in this church, there's a red laser beam on our forehead. Satan wants to take us out. He's got us in his crosshairs. We are a threat to him, and he will do anything he can to find the weakest member in the church or, or uh, someone who's just dragging in here, half here, half out, and he's going to break through that person's life, and once he's on the inside, he's going to begin to do an inside job within the fellowship of our church and begin to pass around unbelief and a bad attitude and a foul spirit and try to divide and drive a wedge into the fellowship of our church seen it happen several times in the last few years and so what paul's saying to us here is stand firm hold your position do not back up do not put your armor down be on guard for you may be the very entry point you may be i'm talking to you I'm talking to myself too but you whoever's listening you may be the very entry point for the devil himself if your mind and your heart are not in the right place and he's prowling around like a lion, seeking to devour you. So Paul says, I want to hear that you're standing firm in the face of spiritual conflict. You must not flee. You must not compromise. You must not give in. You must not back down in, in a godless society, in a world that's surrounding us with nothing but opposing views and ideologies on the outside, including politics. Stand firm, he says. How? How do we stand firm? Well, he goes on, right? He says, stand firm in one spirit with one mind. In one spirit refers, refers to, to the entire human spirit here. This represents the entire inner human life of a person. In fact, the, the word for mind uh, with one mind is actually the word suke, or where we get psyche, psyche or soul. Paul says, you need to stand firm with one spirit and with one mind. In other words, you need to interlock arms with the person on your left and right and share the same convictions and, uh, and truth and share the same allegiance and the loyalty to Jesus Christ to hold your ground and to stand firm together. Now, who are the opponents that we need to stand firm with one mind against? Well, the opponents here are on the outside and there's one on the inside. Those on the outside are the secular philosophies and worldly ideologies and political realms that, that were circulating in the ancient world and the Greek, uh, with the Greek myth, mythology and Greek worldviews and man-centered thinking. Not much different than today. The only thing ours is steeped in politics and our identifying with those instead of identifying with the Lord. The outside world is a threat to the church because the church too often gets caught up in worldly ideologies, philosophy, and politics of the day. It's everywhere. Look at Christians and what they're posting on social media. That stuff seems more important right now than the gospel to many people. And I hope I'm not talking to you. There's also an opponent inside the church. For the Philippians, it was a group of people called Judaizers. And they were a group of people that were spreading false doctrine and false teaching about the one true saving gospel. They were saying that you had to be circumcised to be a Christian, making the gospel of grace into a gospel of works. They were false teachers in the church. They were legalistic, and legalism is a false gospel. It says, do this, earn this. That's a false gospel, according to Galatians chapter 1. So Paul begins, and he says, you need to stand firm together in the gospel i want to appeal to all of us listening this morning it really matters what you believe it really matters that you stand strong and stand firm it's not enough to to just rely on the elders to stand firm it's not enough just to rely on the deacons and the trustees to stand firm this is a call for every man, every woman, every teenager, every college student, every believer in Christ. You're going to have to stand strong in these days in order that our church and our fellowship will be able to stand strong in the Lord. All of us together have to stand strong. If you let a little drop of poison slip through the line into the drinking water, it begins to spread like gangrene, brothers and sisters, and it will be used by the devil to bring about great damage to the ministry of the church which is not a ministry about us. It's a ministry about knowing, going, and growing. Knowing, growing, and going. And believe me, Satan is trying his hardest, 
as we're walking through this very tough time and trying to replan our church, become more uh, in line with the Word of God, as we're trying to make a pivot in our, in our philosophy of ministry to make our church more geared towards discipleship of families and outreach to our community. Satan's trying to separate us. And he's working hard to get us to cling to the idols of our hearts as we consider doing things differently. So this applies to us this morning. We have to stand firm in the gospel. If the things that are bothering us about anything that this church is, is contemplating doing, if those things are in line with the gospel, then we have to stand strong in that. Stand strong in the gospel, not in the things that we want. We must stand strong strong, stand firm together in the gospel, or the gospel will not go forth. If we're not standing firm, we're not living a life worthy of the gospel. And so the first characteristic is we must stand firm. But not only must we stand firm together for the gospel, but second, as you see on the screen, we must struggle or strive together for the gospel. Paul says, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, this word striving, again, it's a picturesque word. Um, striving together is, is uh, uh, again, is one word in the original language. is athleto, or athlete, athletics. It means to compete in a wrestling match, WWE style. And so this means that we're to be wrestling together, but tag team, not opposed to each other, right? We're to be on the same team in this wrestling match. We're not wrestling against each other. We're wrestling as one team, striving together to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Striving together for the gospel means we must maintain our unity in fellowship. Again, any division in our fellowship will mean defeat for the whole team, which will mean defeat for the advancement of the gospel in Brockport, New York. Paul's saying we can only advance the gospel if we're committed to striving together. And in fact, this was already a pressing danger in the church of Philippi. There was already a brewing conflict going on inside of the church of Philippi with two women that couldn't get along. But let me tell you, when there's two women who can't get along, there's also two husbands that aren't going to be getting along. And when you have two men and two women that can't get along, you have two families that can't get along. And when you have two families that can't get along, you have two sets of friends of those families that can't get along. And so just because two women can't get along, there's a fracture that's going right down the center of the Philippian church as everyone's beginning to take sides and stand with their friends and stand with their families. In Philippians 4, this is what's happening in the church. Philippians 4, 2, Paul says, very strongly says, I urge, I exhort, I plead, I beseech these two women, Euodia and Synecdoche, to live in harmony in the Lord. A.K.A., you need to get along with one another. Just lock yourself in a room and say you're not coming out until your issues are resolved, until you ask for, for, for each other's forgiveness, until you both get right with God. This church is going to be in standstill with its gospel testimony because it's not just Euodia and Synecdoche. It's their family, their husbands, their children, their grandchildren, their friends, their Sunday school class, their, their fellowship group. It's going on in the lobby after church is over. It's going on in the beauty parlor during the week. It's what's going on in the golf course during the week. It's what everybody's yakking about. It's what everyone is focused on instead of the gospel. Because of that, now everyone in the church has become a potential entry point for Satan to sink his teeth into the life of the church. He doesn't even have to lift a finger when this happens. All he has to do is turn us against one another. And so Paul says, I urge Euodia and Synecdoche. He urges both of them. He puts the responsibility on both of them. You need to be peacemakers is what he says. You need to be reconcilers so that the whole church can stand together in unity for the sake of the gospel. It's convicting stuff, isn't it? The gospel is that important, brothers and sisters. If we can't get along in the church, how are people going to want to listen to us outside of the church? Back to chapter 1, verse 27. No wonder Paul says what he says here. No wonder he says you must be striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, notice what Paul goes on to say now in verse 28. 
striving together, struggling together, not being intimidated in any way by our opponents. This is proof to them of destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. Here's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, I don't want you to become alarmed just because there's some opposition that comes your way, either from the inside or the outside, from worldly philosophies or internal struggles. As you're striving together, I want you in no way to be alarmed by your opponents, is what he says. And then he goes on, right? He says, as you are standing and striving together and not letting your opponents intimidate you, living like this proves that you stand on the truth and, and, and the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. By living this way as a church, we're making a loud, clear statement. It is such a strong statement that it's proof that unbelievers and their decisions are leading them to destruction. Living together for, the, for a life worthy of the gospel is a sign of the truthfulness of the gospel because it shows that we're willing to suffer for and willing to pray the price for the gospel. Living like this shows the opponents, both in and outside the church, that you won't be turned against each other. And that you will lock arms with your brothers and sisters in Christ and together you will stand firm and stand strong as you strive together for the gospel. Not for yourselves, for the gospel. Standing firm and striving together as a church is a clear testimony to unbelievers of the truthfulness that you say you believe. But when you're yakking with one another, when you're nitpicking one another, when you're talking about others behind their back and being mean to each other, spreading things in the church, it's a crummy testimony to unbelievers a strong sign and a strong testimony when you exercise unconditional love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. It verifies the truthfulness of the gospel that you say you believe. It's a strong statement of faith. It brings assurance of your salvation that God is at work in your life and that there's true love in your heart for your brothers and your sisters in Christ. As Paul says in verse 28, living like this shows that you're really saved. Which, of course, means that if you're not standing strong and striving together for the gospel, it calls your salvation into question. If you always have your dukes up ready to fight everybody inside and outside the church, it calls, into your, co it calls your salvation into question. It forces you to ask, whose side are you really on? Look at the last two words of verse 28. This is where we're going to stop in the text for this week. Paul says, and this is God's doing, God's doing. The destruction is from God and salvation is from God. And how you stand strong and stand firm is a powerful sign to the watching world and to your unsaved family members and your unsaved neighbors and to those that you work with. It's a sign of their destruction because they don't believe. And it's a sign of your salvation and that you're a true follower of Jesus Christ. This is a powerful four-verse passage, isn't it? We're going to stop here for this week. We'll pick it up next time where we left off. But let me conclude by saying this. This one word that the message is all about, that the entire book of Philippians is all about, that really the Bible is all about, the gospel, right? The gospel. And the gospel is this. The gospel is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting eternal life. The gospel is that Jesus Christ has come to seek and save the lost. The gospel is that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a sinless and perfect life, and then he went to the cross by divine appointment because he was the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. And there, while on the cross, he died in the place of all those that will put their faith and their trust in him. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. On the cross, Jesus Christ was lifted up and he became our sin bearer. And he suffered under the wrath of God and eternal judgment for our sins. He shed his blood. He made the only atonement for our sins, the only forgiveness, the only washing away of the guilty stain of sin is in the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. And for those of us that are believers, it thrills our hearts just to hear these words. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. 
If you will believe in Jesus Christ in a moment, in that moment, in an instant, he will make you faultless to stand before the throne of God. He will clothe you with his perfect righteousness. And when he looks on you, he will not see all the sin in your life anymore. It will all be covered by the blood and the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is the offer that God makes to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's nothing you can do to earn it or, or achieve it. All you do is receive it as a free gift by faith. You extend your empty hand of faith and receive the gift of salvation as you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord. If you've never believed on Jesus Christ, why not today? Why not this moment? Why not just give your life to Christ right now and surrender your life to him? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he will bring you into his family. He will bring you into his kingdom. He will make you a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. The very second that you believe, you will be saved. Being in church won't save you. Being brought up in the church won't save you. Being baptized will not save you. Taking the Lord's Supper will not save you. Being a good person will not save you. Doing good deeds will not save you. There is only one thing that will save you. And that is, the, is, that is your full faith in the worthy gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray that you've given your heart fully to Christ, even if you have claimed salvation for many years and you realize that maybe you're not saved. Today is the day. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this message. Thank you for this beautiful exhortation that we are to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Thank you for convicting us that that's more than just saying I believe, that there's a certain way to live, and that we do that as individuals and as a church, individual Christians in the church. I pray, Father, for our church. I pray, Lord, that you would be the one that gets all the attention, none of us, Lord. I pray that you get the attention in our homes, in this church building, and in, in our small groups, and as we go into the, the community and serve and teach them about Jesus. I pray it's all about you, I pray for anyone who's not making it about you, Father, that you would convict them, Lord, and you would um, help them become unified and, and, and center their entire lives around the gospel. We love you. We pray that we would be known as people that are living lives worthy of the gospel each and every day. I pray, Father, for our, our church family. I pray that you would be with them in these tough, tough times. Lord, I pray that they would be bold to share their struggles to confess their sins, and together as a church, help us to strive and struggle together to bring glory to your name as we give everything to you for the sake of Jesus Christ. We love you. Thank you for what you did for us on the cross, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. If there is anything that you guys need, please let us know.